Hi guys, it's Luton here, and I'm joined today again by Dasgro. And uh, I should also say, I was actually I was going to be joined by Sergeant Merrill today, but um, he's always busy with the weekend, so he couldn't join us today. Um, but what we're going to be talking about is uh, the idea of gun ownership. And um, in general, obviously, we know that there's been a few incidents in the US uh, recently, and very recently, there's been a, you know quite a large one going on over there. And um, I think it's just kind of sparked people to think again about this sort of topic, just about gun ownership in general, really. And um, it's something that I was actually going to make a video about a while ago. Um, I spoke to a few different people. I was going to get a little panel of sort of people pro and against and all this kind of thing, and I was going to talk about it. And it, it never really happened. And then uh, Merrill posted a video, which I will link below, so people can go check out his opinion um, about this topic. And, um, you know, so I thought it would be a good time to just discuss it a little bit further. Now, Dasgro is, you know, he's got a lot of knowledge in this area. So, again, it's a good person to kind of talk and discuss around this whole issue. But I think one thing that I would say is that I don't think it's really... I mean, I personally as well, I don't really feel I'm well informed enough to make a resounding conclusion one way or the other. But I do think it's interesting to talk around it as a general topic and think about the kind of issues that we deal with when we when it comes to gun ownership um, for civilians. So, Dasko, first of all, what do you think are the main kind of sort of sticking points? What is it really do you think that people get kind of hung up when it comes to this issue? Well, I, I think that what... A lot of people are are doing when they're when they're discussing these gun topics generally is is that they're doing it uh, without proper understanding of what certain terms mean, what certain definitions are, uh, without a good understanding of what the laws do and don't say, both in the United States and abroad for that matter. Mm. It's very easy to, to to sort of talk in platitudes about certain things should be banned or certain things should be allowed, but when you start getting into the the uh, sort of meat and potatoes of it, looking at, at how the laws are set up, looking at how we how the how both from a technical perspective and from a legal perspective we define certain types of weapons, certain types of ammunition, hmm. the, and their uses, we find that it's actually a whole lot more complicated to yeah. regulate. Yeah, very and, much. And so. then, and and then we also have to take into the into account the cultural factor yeah. in the sense that there are. Uh, millions upon millions of of individuals in the U.S. and uh, in in countries that do have strong gun ownership mm. uh, that are uh, that that are regular uh, target shooters or hunters yeah. or, I, or I, I, shooters. I think something that's kind of interesting. And I thought a bit more about this. Um, I mean, I think people would be surprised to know because I'm quite a liberal person. But when it comes to kind of gun ownership, I, you know, when you really start to think about it there's a lot more to it than it's not as simple as just saying well if we had no guns there would be no problem it really doesn't work that way and I, I think people need to kind of have a realistic understanding of what could actually be done to try and solve an issue and taking away you know people's ability to own these you know guns as such it, it, I don't really see that it would have any major improvement in the kind of situations that people are talking about but one thing that I had thought of which was quite interesting is that I think people often forget when they compare different countries in different situations is they forget historically how the culture of things has kind of developed over time now when you look at the UK and you look at that compare it to the US in terms of how you know gun ownership has gone on through time. Over here in the UK, there hasn't really been a time when, you know, for hundreds of years even, where people have had, kind of civilians, have, have really owned weapons as such. It tends to be the military and people in the kind of sports hunting arena, and that's it really. Um, there, there's, there's never been kind of wholesale weapons over here and so on and so on. But obviously in the US, for a long, long time, almost ever since... Um, people started living in the US and, and moved over there. Um, that's really been a kind of staple of the you know the economy there. There's been people selling weapons, dealing with weapons, owning weapons, and all these kind of things. So it's a very kind of culturally entrenched thing. And I don't think it's something that people can just turn around and say, oh, we're not going to do that now. It's, it's just never going to happen. That's totally unrealistic. And you know, also it's it's a kind of cultural identity as well. It's something that is very ingrained in people when you go from generation to generation. And I think that that is a major factor that needs to be taken into consideration. Really, I, I could agree with that. The uh, there are a number of countries out there that that have uh, either strong gun cultural cultures from a, a folk perspective, but also uh, ones that have uh, have strong constitutions or legal basis for gun ownership. 
if you look at how uh, some of the Commonwealth countries have dealt with gun ownership in the past and the language that they have in their constitution is relative to the United States, it's uh, a lot more ambiguous. And mm-hmm. as such, more uh, draconian laws can be passed. And, 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 as, and that's sort of what makes the United States a bit different is – we do have a constitution that is very explicit in gun ownership and has been recently affirmed uh, up to the, su- the Supreme Court, the highest court in the United States. Mm-hmm. And they state uh, that that these uh, rights are, are not for hunting. They're not for collecting. And I'm in that collecting. I, I'm part of that collection subculture. Instead, it's for self-defense and self-defense exclusively. Mm. And the, the lower courts are still trying to work out what that means and does it mean because there are – we have ne- nearly 40 years of, of case law and of, of legislative action mm. that does not uh, define it in that context. Yeah. Instead, they define it in a hunting context and as such, the laws are set up that way. And so it's very it, – it's very – difficult to balance because hypothetically there could be a uh, a, situ- a a policy enacted similar to what they did in Australia or in the UK 10 15 20 years ago where yeah. they seized all the semi-automatic rifles and yeah. all the semi-automatic yeah. pistols and uh and if I can just if I can just elaborate for people that don't know what happened in the UK, we had a couple of quite severe incidents. Uh, one was a school shooting, and at that point, the government basically decided to clamp down. And they said, "Right, I think there was a gun amnesty where people could turn in weapons." They said, from this point, civilian ownership of you know, for example, semi-automatic rifles and such is not really going to be allowed. I think I, I don't think it's allowed really, unless uh, there may be some kind of special license for collectors. I don't know, but uh, I don't know the ins and outs of the law. But I do know that, yeah, like you say, for the most part. They, you know, they drew a line there and said no. But again, uh, very recently we've had incidents and things, and it it doesn't necessarily mean that these kind of things aren't going to happen or that people aren't going to do bad things. It just means that they're not going to do bad things with these specific items. Sure, and that's that 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 can be a a factor in as well. In the in Australia with the Port Arthur massacre in the uh, mid '90s, they also had a. Uh, an amnesty out there, and it was very. It took a long time for for them to get everything. And and regardless of your opinion of gun control, in Australia to this day, there are still semi-automatic rifles and fully automatic rifles turn up uh, in in houses as 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 the elderly are passing or uh, in the in, in the hands of criminals. And one could attribute that simply to the fact that there was a lot of weapons at the time that were in Australia and that the amnesty wasn't 100% effective or alternatively the, uh, the borders aren't as, as secure as they'd like them to be. But uh, there have been different countries who have tried different types of policies to address this issue and uh, with varying degrees of efficacy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, a lot of people would say, okay, it's going to be unrealistic to sort of outright just say we're not going to have guns. That's never going to happen, okay. But do you think that there is uh, a, an argument, is there a reason to sort of say that we should draw some kind of compromises here? For example, like you say, in the UK, uh, we said, all right, we're not going to allow semi automatic rifles, and the licensing for other weapons is extremely, uh, you know, it's really cracked down. It's not, you know, um, I don't know if this happens. I mean, I, I know that you own uh, weapons and stuff. Um, I mean, do you have sort of regular inspections? People come around and see how you're storing those things? Because over here, for example, I think if you own weapons, it's a case that you have to have a locked box. It has to be concreted into the ground, and the police will come on a, a yearly basis to come and inspect that and make sure that you're looking after them in the correct way and making sure that they're safely stored and so on and so on. But um, so just again as well, though, do you think that there's room as well also for kind of compromises to sort of say we should take certain categories out? Um, or, for example, if you lived out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you, you, you're not really able to be supported by the police structure if you live a very long way away from any major kind of conurbations um, or if you lived in what could be classified maybe a high risk area maybe there's a lot of crime and all this kind of thing do you think there's ever room for kind of as I say compromises there to make more specific rulings on things well well first for context the uh, depending on what state you live in uh, and depending on whether you are a civilian or a far or a licensed firearms dealer, uh, there's going to be varying degrees of inspection for most people, civilians, and even certain types of collectors. There's no inspection requirement, nor 
in most states, is there a storage requirement? And the, the storage requirement issue is a bit tricky because uh, it's how do you define what uh, is adequate storage? Is it is it based off of uh, how thick of steel you have in your safe? Is it based off of how... Uh, uh, how mobile the gun is. So if someone could simply steal the safe, are you in breach of the law? Mm-hmm. The, the, the problem is that the laws are very ambiguous in this respect. And the closest thing that I've seen to, to these kind of laws that, that has been reviewed by courts was the, the recent Heller uh, case in what I believe to the Supreme Court, uh, which was a Washington, D.C. law that, uh, amongst other things, they required that the guns be uh, in a lockbox and and or have a uh, a trigger a trigger lock on them and be disassembled, mm. and and so there was an there was sort of an an, an interesting dialogue during the uh, the oral arguments where the lawyers were arguing how fast they could unlock this uh, <laughs> trigger lock and assemble the gun and load the gun yeah. to engage a uh, a predator, and uh, it was and it was a very fascinating dialogue, but it was one where they sort of viewed, the Supreme Court viewed it as a bit too uh, draconian and yeah. saying that they don't they don't think that is appropriate because it doesn't allow you to, to readily be able to defend yourself. Now, that being said, there, there, there's, in, in, the, in, the, in the game of, of, of politics and the game of career legislation, there's always, there's always going to be some form of compromise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can't speak to what types of legislation there should be to create more background checks or more mental health uh, checks or uh, checks on on uh, on storage but there's certainly a number of things that I'd like to see uh, change that would be for you know pro uh, second amendment such as uh, the reopening of the machine gun registry mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people have this idea that when in the media they say they're using automatic weapons well, in a majority of the time, they're using semi-automatic weapons, which are uh, one pull the trigger it equals one bullet being expelled from that barrel. And full automatic weapons, sort of the ones we see in movies and television, they they there is a an artificial limit of the number of machine guns in the United States that are for sale. That because they stop the the registry, they're registered weapons that require special uh, a special uh, registration process to acquire these guns. That, registra- that registration stopped for machine guns in 1986, which is uh, which is you know all, over 25 years ago. And because of that, if you want to buy a machine gun, you can buy one. You today and the United States can buy a machine gun. You can buy a Mac 10. You can buy an AK-47. But it's going to cost you anywhere between five to twenty-five thousand dollars. Which is a lot of money. It's more than a car in most cases, just because artificial supply out there. And I, so, I'd love to see that registry reopened. And and as some people say, well, Dastro, you're talking about all these machine guns that are getting into the market. All these people are going to have machine guns now. Well, <laughs> of the of the of the people that uh, these machine guns have existed in the United States now for nearly 80 years, in one respect or another, 200,000 registered machine guns in the United States. There's only been uh, two or three cases in which these registered machine guns have been used in a crime, and then in a majority of those cases, they were actually used by law enforcement mm-hmm. who had them legally registered to them, not as agencies, but as them as individuals who are using them uh, for you know, felonious crime. And that is something that's interesting to think about. The I registration think- process is very, is very draconian. It requires fingerprints. It requires passport photos. It requires you going to your sheriff and get or 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 chief law enforcement officer and get their signature. Yeah. It requires ex- an extensive FBI background check. Yeah. But uh, but nonetheless, though, we don't see these problems. And so uh, th- th- there there is, of course, some give and take. If there was new legislation passed forward, and I, I'm not going to speak to anything specifically, but it's mm-hmm. it's something that there are there are certain Things that can be changed. I think two things that I think about from this. One was something we talked about already uh, ourselves. One when we come to sort of technicalities of changing weapons. And was it California you said before had uh, they they weren't allowing sort of automatic weapons or something like that? What was it we talked about? Oh, uh, in, there there are a number of, of states within the United States that do have their own state specific laws. Mm. So, for instance, uh, Connecticut and California 
uh, have assault weapons bans, which are yeah. essentially bans on semi-automatic rifles that look like military-grade automatic rifles. But then it was interesting so, so, what we talked about, how they people then find loopholes and technicalities. And I think this is where it's interesting, is where people say, well, if we make some compromises and we make some tweaks in the law, people are going to be safer. But then, you know, how, how do you really define safer? And also, if you can just explain for people how people find these sort of little technical things and the adaptions people make to get around them, I think it's quite interesting. Well, I'll as an example with the California uh, law in place, uh, assault weapons, or which is sort of a catch-all term. It's not really a. It's it's a, it's a very vague legal term, and it's not a technical term in the sense of of, of it actually being a class of weapons. But it's essentially military-grade automatic rifles uh, that are semi-automatic clones. Those are not allowed. And so here's how they get around it. So the law the laws essentially state that if if the weapon has a pistol grip, it has a folding stock or a collapsible stock, if it has a detachable magazine, if it has a muzzle device, uh, and it's semi-automatic, it's considered a, uh, assault, an assault weapon to California law. Now, granted, I don't live in California, and so for those that are uh, from California or, or visit Cal Guns a lot, uh, feel free to correct me, but I'm, again, speaking generally here. What they can do to get around it is that if the gun does not have these kinds of aesthetic features – then it ceases to be an assault weapon and then can be legal. And so what they'll do with like an AR-15, for example, is that they'll remove the pistol grip. And when they remove the pistol grip, they'll replace it with a hunting stock. Now, it looks goofy as hell, but they replace it with a hunting stock, like, a, like a, an angled 15-degree stock like you'd see in a traditional shotgun. And, then it beca- and, and with that and with the change in the muzzle device, it then becomes a sporting rifle and thus is legal in California. Now, mechanically, it doesn't change the operation at all, but it uh, is now compliant. Likewise, if they want to maintain their pistol grip, sometimes they'll add what's called a bullet button, so they'll re- replace the the magazine release button with one that takes a, bit, a special <coughs> key, and that special key you can wear on your on your finger like a ring. Mm. And all you gotta do is you gotta you know push that little. It's like a, it's like a little com or a little uh, like uh, airport security lock. We just have to put in a little tiny key, and then you you push it in, and then it unlo- and then the magazine will drop. Yeah. And because of that, it's considered not a detachable magazine, but a fixed magazine because it requires a special tool to unlock it. Now the tools are very easy to use, and you can wear it on your finger. But that's how people can get around these laws, and. And because it's very difficult to legislate yeah. this kind of, of of weapon, because from a, um, a a a mechanical perspective, they are identical to the semi-automatic rifles that your that your parents or grandparents or your relatives use yeah. for hunting. And I guess and, I, I think this is the point: is that there's all these technicalities and legislations that people try to put in place, and really, it doesn't solve any kind of issue because people will just find ways around it. And there's plenty of other options if people really wanted to do something anyway. And we've to- we've talked a lot about the kind of mechanical technical aspects here, but thinking more on the social side of things. And I think, like we're saying. There's often a huge amount of background checks. People have to be registered and all these kind of things to own these weapons. But the point is is that quite often people that commit crimes like murder or whatever, they more often than not can be two extremes. They can either be someone who has got severe issues, psychological problems or whatever, and in which case you would hope that that kind of person would not be able to they would not be able to go through the normal processes to gain access to these kind of things the other people and this has been the case with quite a few of these incidents tend to be normal people they tend to be people who have up until that point have a clean criminal record they have not really had any kind of unusual activity but something in their life makes them snap and at that point they become incredibly dangerous and they're going to do whatever it is that's going on inside of their head But I think that leads us on to another point, which is that when it comes, and this is really, I mean, I struggled with this and I thought a lot about it because, um, as I say, I'm quite a liberal person. I live in the UK. There isn't a major gun culture over here. So from my own perspective, it seems, you know, it seems unusual sometimes to imagine people owning all of these different kinds of weapons. However, as I say, I think you have to respect different countries' cultures. And like I already talked about, you have to look at America's culture that has gone on through the last few hundred years, that it's been a major sort of intrinsic part of American culture. And I don't think anybody really has the right to say, well, 
you've got to take that away. I, I don't think that's really right because I think it will kind of gut uh, something that's been a major part of a society for a long time, be that in any country, you know. Um, unless it was, unless there was like some major, major issue that came up that really, really had to be dealt with. Um, but I, I think it's interesting, like I say, when you think about the way in which people sort of enact situations where they become criminals. And I, I think the point is that we talked about before as well was that if you were to remove guns, is that person going to be any less dangerous? Are they going to find any other way of doing whatever it is that's going on inside their head? Of course they are. I mean, there's been many situations where people have taken a car or a vehicle or a truck and they've just gone on a rampage, just driving people down and whatever. And, you know, there are many there are many tools if you would want to use that word which isn't particularly nice but there are many ways in which people could carry out these kind of insane acts if they wanted to and i mean what do you think about that when it comes to this idea and and what can we really do about that i mean is there really anything you can do if if something snaps inside someone's head can you really stop that person i don't think you can um well, i, I- I tend to, to sort of equate it to a sort of a crude child example. Uh, I, rem- I don't know how, how prevalent this is in the UK, but in the United States, as a kid, you could go to these different amusement parks or fast food restaurants or things like that, and they'd have big play places, like big ball pits and slides mm. and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, all plastic. all and, and I remember often there would be, you go into this when there's a lot of kids. They're all playing together in the ball pit. And there'd always be a few kids that were super aggressive. Mm. And they would be throwing balls at you. And they'd even, like, be hitting you and punching you. <laughs> yeah. And and, and it was really aggressive. And you usually have to get out of there. Or you'd, like, you know, form these little little uh, squads and try yeah. to you know, defend yourself, whatever. And But to me, in the case of, of these problem children, I sort of view any of this this – the question of, of 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 guns versus other types of methods as the equivalent of of well this child has a problem let's let's just put some mitts on him or put some gloves on him so that he when he hits people it isn't hit him as hard and as such have to worry about it yeah. it doesn't address the bigger issues of mental health yeah, and the yeah. bigger issues of identifying those issues and in the United States it's very difficult because we have a we have a very individualist individualistic culture that um, has issues with the idea of government services intruding on our private lives and our and our private affairs and questioning our our mental capacities mm. and that's so that, that's difficult because there is uh, I would suspect that if there was greater uh, m- mental health checks or greater social services associated with individuals that may be problematic then I, then some of these may be. Some of these issues that we talk about may be uh, less done. And I'm really not even talking about these recent spat of shootings. I'm talking about pe- people's actions generally. And and that's something that is very difficult to to legislate. It's very difficult to implement. And uh, But I, I think that one can only look at how the United States deals with, um, with uh, the, our prison system yeah. and compare that to Canada – and see how that that in the United States we are we are much more draconian about uh, about punishment, and we are much more uh, focused on 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 making sure that that, that those people are, are appropriately punished, and we do not focus nearly enough mm-hmm. on rehabilitation. And as such, we uh, we see all these a number of these these prisoners who once they get released, uh, they tend to revert back to criminality, um, or worse yet. Be- become hardened yeah they often have very poor support networks and this is something we talked about i think there's two things we talked about just here that are very interesting one is like you say the social aspect and the kind of medical aspect now i think it would be an interesting one to mention there's been a lot of talk about the kind of healthcare system in the u.s and i know that there's a large sort of uh, train uh, changing process going on right now with a lot of discussion about what's going to happen with the healthcare system in the u.s but it makes me wonder that with a healthcare system which is very uh, it, it often can really prevent people um who maybe as we're talking about have these issues but they're obviously perhaps in a kind of a, a personal situation where they can't really afford proper health care they probably can't afford to see and um also you know people maybe are not looking out for them as such not going to find them so much they don't have that same support network as as some other countries do makes me wonder if in a bigger picture that may be a factor in to itself that 
if there was a more accessible, more uh, sort of st- government sponsored healthcare system that made it easier for people to get access to these kind of things whether that would be an outlet for those people whether it would be but who can say oh, really, maybe, you know maybe i can't i mean i can't speak to what kind of solution there could or couldn't be in the case of canada their rehabilitation is much more uh it's, it's much different compared to what we have in the united states with mm. their with their with their prisoners and they will uh and they make it a a they make a very strong effort to get them jobs and to relocate them into environments that are uh, not conducive to this criminal behavior. Mm. And uh, their uh, their uh, their crime rates are lower, and the and the recidiv- uh, recidivism rate is also lower, which is which is profound. And and, and, it, and I'm talking about this in the context of adjusting for population differences. It really is quite a bit lower, yeah. and you could you could subscribe this to a number of things, and and I'm I I am not saying that the cause of this is because of the how how they they do rehabilitation. This yeah. is simply a correlation. Well, there's there's never right? one there's never right. one cause. I think that's the I think that's the thing that people often have trouble when they're talking about these kind of topics is that people like to discuss a topic and then say, well, it's because of this. And I see this very often in discussions about politics and things in general or war or crime or whatever it may be. People tend to, they like to have one thing that they can put their finger on and say, if we fix this, it would make everything better. That's a very kind of naive perspective to have. There is never one thing. It's a massive patchwork of many, many different situations and things that over a very long time have created issues. And it's not something that you can fix immediately because it's going to take just as much time to unpick all those problems and try different things and try and make things better little by little. And like you said, the rehabilitation thing is only one aspect of a bigger picture, but it's one that Again, I, I agree. I do think it plays quite a prevalent role in the way that people enact towards one another and the way as a society as well, it can start to develop and benefit you as a society. And um, I don't think it's just the US that has this this kind of mentality of um, punishing criminals. I think the UK is very much like this. You only have to look in our kind of uh, media over here and uh, the kind of public opinion in general. I mean, whenever there is a... Um, Whenever there is a high-profile criminal case in the UK, the first thing you see people saying, "Bring back hanging." That's the first thing people always say. There is a huge, kind really? of, yeah. There's a huge amount of people like, in like, this country, like like like, a, like lynching them, hanging. No, kind of thing? <laughs> no, no. More in the case that some people believe that the death penalty should come back in the oh, UK. Oh, 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 you're just yeah. talking about capital punishment. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not okay. not lucky people like <laughs> dragging them out of their house and stringing them up on a tree. No. Yeah, um, <laughs> But um, that's, that's pretty cryptic. Okay. <laughs> no, sorry. And um, but but I think it is interesting. You see, and it, it's this idea that people have where they really feel like if someone has wronged society, if there's a criminal and they have created an act which has wronged society as a whole, not even an individual. But I think often nowadays with the kind of plugged in media that people have, when they see a big criminal case, they almost feel like affronted themselves. They feel like they've kind of you know how dare this person commit this act in our society they feel like a part of it and i think that's why people often have very passionate responses about this person should be punished to the full extent of the law and the trouble is is that's fine except if you don't help that person change themselves mentally the only thing that will happen is when that person comes back out they're probably going to come out of that system in a much more negative state of mind than they went in and the whole point is that you know, you have to try and rise above it. The fact that this person has created a terrible crime of whatever kind. Um, now, I'm not saying that, again, this is not trying to be too specific. There's obviously sometimes when some people would commit a certain crime. And I genuinely believe that if they have done so, then maybe, the, you know, there's a, a strong argument that that person should not continue to be a member of society. But when you look at other incidents, there are some people who maybe have done, uh, you know, a bad thing. And you really do need to help these people kind of try and change their mentality, try and change their lives around. Because if you don't, the only thing that will happen is they'll continue to be a negative part of society. And then that just creates a a, a, a deepening spiral of, of, of negativity that will just go on and on and on. But as you say, I think often countries which do have a more liberal uh, approach to rehabilitation and a better approach to it, you, you can look at the data and it does stack up. There has been a lot of studies into the way prisons work, especially in this country, in the UK. We've done a lot of studies into prisons and every study pretty much conclusively shows that constant prison sentences 
do nothing. They do nothing to change the way people are. And they do the only thing that they do is they take those criminals off of the streets. Um, and as soon as those criminals come, they often have this thing where they, they have uh, the police, they hit like a certain area and they lock up a load of these criminals of whatever, you know, if there's a spree of crimes, they find these guys, they put them in prison and then the crime rate goes down until those guys come back out of prison. And as soon as they do, the crime rate goes back up again. So it, it, it's, it doesn't really solve the problem. You're just moving people from one place to another. And I think that is often a, a major contributing issue, you know? Yeah, I can I can agree with that. There's, I mean, I, I for one, live in a, in a, in a city that is, that is very dangerous. It, it's been consistently ranked in top five as most dangerous cities in the United States. And, uh, and it's, and the, the crime rates are very, you know, centric in, uh, in in certain areas, and there's there's very there they do sweeps, and the sweeps come and go, and they put them in jail, or they put them in, in and they they stay in the jail for a while, and they they get out, and they go through the appeal process, and it's it's a it's a uh, unfortunately a, a cycle that that is very hard to correct, and you can you, you can try to change it through uh, rehabilitation, you can. Uh, because in the end, we're, we're, what were we really trying to accomplish? We're trying to reduce crime, trying to reduce incidents. And personally, I while while this topic was originally discussed, because we're we're talking about these these mass shootings, mm. the, the much bigger issue in the United States with gun violence is uh, is unfortunately uh, drug related. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, gun violence. We look at at how how many uh, of our of our youth die from uh, these gun tra- or these these uh, gang transactions with 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 drugs, and we uh, and it's it, the, the statistics are numbing. And yes, I use yeah. the word numbing because it's it happens so often that the news doesn't cover it. Yeah, and that's it. I, can I, if I can just jump in here, I just think yeah, I, I just want to say one point is that I, I think that's a really interesting point to make is that when you have these sort of large scale incidents, which obviously and I think correctly coverage because they are an appalling tragedy and therefore it's something that people it it does generate a lot of comment because people see this as a an appalling thing and they want to to say something about it but i i think it's worth remembering like you say that when you try and look at the larger picture over perhaps the you know the the annual situation in a country you really need to look at the uh, the other situations that are happening for example i'm just going to say as an example in the uk if you were to look at sort of say gun crime murders compared to or for example in london knife crime has been a, this is actually a very interesting thing as as well to bring in is that obviously over here we have very strict gun laws but over in london we've had last year a spate of knife crime a huge amount of knife crime it was in the it was in the newspaper almost every week there was a, a murder due to related knife crime, and it just went on and on and on and on. So I, I think, again, only reaffirms this idea that if you take one weapon out of there, they're just going to use whatever else it was. There was There's kids in London going into stores buying kitchen knives so that they can arm themselves up when they go out in the evening, and that's that's just the way it goes, you know? Sorry, going back on with you. Well, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, and, and the, oh, well, they're using knives instead of instead of guns. It, it doesn't, it, it detracts from the, the real issue, which is, why are these crimes happening? Shouldn't we be focused on on these, uh, on on these, on, on not on not just reducing deaths per se, but reducing crimes? Because yeah. that's it, uh, while I appreciate the well, uh, a less effective tool means less deaths. Got it. But, that, but that, it, it goes beyond that. Yeah, we should be disgusted by by the crimes happening in the first place. If people have and, the will to do it, they're going to do it one way or the other, aren't they? Well, maybe, but. Perhaps there are uh, there are social and, ec- and economic factors uh, at play, or they don't have the support network. They don't have the middle health network to uh, to uh, m- make them not turn to a to a, a criminal act. Mm. I uh, one of the things that I you know, just to go back to this topic of 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 murders in the United States. Right now, Chicago, which is you know, a pretty decent city in terms of size. They're they're reaching near 450 murders uh, thus far for uh, this year alone, mm. and to or to put it another way, there are on a given week there's anywhere from from seven to ten people dying from essentially uh, uh, gang violence or or being 
a, uh, a, a casualty of gang violence by being a, a sort of third party that's simply uh, there when an act takes place. And that is, uh, that's a very grim <clears throat> statistic to think about given the fact that, that this is just one city out there and this sort of violence is happening quite a bit. And a lot of this, a lot of the, the guns being used are either Saturday Night Specials, which are uh, which is a, a term used for essentially sub two hundred dollar guns that are that jam, but use small calibers like twenty two or twenty five ACP or thirty two ACP or even nine millimeter. But uh, and but they're not using assault weapons or non sporting rifles that look like military weapons or whatever it may mm, be. Mm. Uh, and and the, it's very close up. It's very personal and it's it's very ugly. And uh, while Saturday night specials have been have been sort of regulated a little bit here and there or have been in the past, uh, they're still they're still very much accessible. And because of how straw purchases operate, which is when you essentially get a family member or a relative to buy the gun for you, uh, then they just give it to you, uh, mm. then the guns are still accessible. And even in, in, in Chicago with Illinois, that have very draconian gun laws that require special re- special registration and special licensing to even get a, a weapon. In the case of, of Chicago, uh, I I do believe that there's a handgun ban. So you, or until very recently, with the recent Miller ca- or uh, not Miller case, with the recent uh, Chicago gun case, uh, which affirmed that you can have a handgun in Chicago. Um, only now people can legally have them. It's a it's a real big question, and and with Sh- Illinois specifically, the Seventh Court, which is a, a lower court below the Supreme Court, recently ruled that Illinois has to change their constitution within 180 days to incorporate some kind of concealed carry law. Yeah. And that's sort of the flip side of this that we're seeing some of the gun community talk about is the right to conceal carry mm. um, as a means to deal with this situation. Now, I don't particularly agree with the idea that that uh, – if there were simply more concealed carry people, this wouldn't happen. Yeah, while yeah. there are cases, while there are cases where that where concealed carry people have uh, stopped these kinds of crimes, going back to the statistics out there, even though that that, that this is a very tragic event and that this uh, that this event is, is is just devastating to everyone and everyone uh, that that has families that could be impacted by this. Statistically speaking, these are very low chance events that yeah. are that that. Very few people out there, and if you look at the fact that only about 10 to 15 percent of the adult qualifying population of, of the United States, uh, at the very most, have concealed carry. And in fact, in a lot of states, it's actually a whole lot lower. Um, there may not be a it may it may ha- have worked. It may have not worked. But it's all speculation, and I really don't want to go into that. But yeah. I, what I do want to say is that that's something that that concealed carry advocates are are certainly talking about. And when you look at at the data that shows of the states that have concealed carry laws that allow mm. you to conceal carry, the, the, there's no conclusive evidence that says that it stops crimes or that it, it, it creates more crimes. There's no blood in the street, mm. despite what a lot of gun control advocates may say. But at the same time, there's no rapid change in the uh, in, in the crime rates. Yeah. Now, uh, that that's something that is very interesting to think about. It basically means that, well, you're broadening people's right to 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 carry guns to protect themselves. It has no the the impact is still up in the air, depending on the states. But the, but the, the the data may still be a bit too much in its infancy. There's a number of states that have that only had maybe five, ten years worth of crime data, and that may not be enough. And so I'm by I'm by no means saying that conclusively it's one or the other, but. Uh, it's th- there's no evidence right now that says that it's it's definitely a bad thing or definitely a good thing. Although personally, I do think that increasing people's rights is a good thing, and that and and so I'm you know I'm, I'm a proponent of it. But it's it's one thing that that is uh, that is also in this argument. I think I'll just come in now to sort of sum up as well. And I think what I would say um, just before I give you a, a one more question, um, I think what I would say is that. As somebody that lives outside the US, um, I like I've already said, I don't think I'm well informed enough to be able to really um, make a strong conclusion and say, I believe that you should do this or this or this. What I would say is that I think it's a very complicated issue. And I think it's not as simple as doing one thing will solve the problem. I think at the same time as well, people need to be respectful 
of different countries' cultures and history. And I think that the US has a long associated history with gun ownership of individuals. It's written into your laws, it's written into your personal rights. And I think that, you know, you have to be respectful of these things when you start making changes to a country because it's something that's been there for an extremely long time. It's very well established for everybody. And whilst uh, you know, a lot of crime and stuff can be attributed to these things. I really don't believe that that is the main cause. And I think there's a lot of more um, more tangible, more realistic solutions that will actually help these, these sort of uh, incidents and uh, the general situation, as we've already spoken about, um, you know, drug and gang crime and all this kind of thing. So I really think that there's a more broader social issue that needs to be addressed before we even start getting into the technicalities of what people can or can't own. Um, but to just bring it back for the last thing, if there was, if there was to be any changes actually made to the technicalities, uh, do you think there were any technicalities that you would like to see brought in place as somebody that personally owns guns? Is there anything that you would like to see that would be brought in? Or do you really think, do you agree with me, that it's not really the time to be sort of getting into these kind of things and that there's other issues that need to be addressed before we even get to that point? Well, I, you know, I'm I'm clearly in the the pro Second Amendment category, and so uh, it, it shouldn't be surprising that I <laughs> I don't think there's any immediate legislative changes that could be done. That being said, I think there is a very uh, tricky mental health issue at hand that is uh, that I don't have a solution for. It is very is very difficult to get around because. Currently, in the United States, the only if, if you the only mental health uh, issues that that as it relates to gun control right now are if you have been determined by a court to be mentally defective or incompetent or 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 been committed by a an, a court to an institution, would you be unable to own a, uh, a a weapon or get or go a pass a background check? But if you uh if you for instance are simply um, uh, if, if you're going through depression or you're going through some kind of, of temporary uh, mental illness and you voluntarily check yourself into a mental health facility and stay there for a week or so and then get out, you're not – you can still buy a weapon because you're voluntarily committing yourself. You're, it's not mandated by a court. And as such, uh, that that will be something that is – that would not flag you. Now – one could say, well, we should just – anyone who goes into a mental health facility should be unable to buy a gun. Well, voluntary committing yourself is a voluntary act and as such, it's, it's, it, it, you're now actually creating a disincentive for people to, to attend mental health facilities be, uh, uh, over the fear that they're going to lose their gun rights. And that's something that is – that uh, has to be considered, especially with the, with the most recent uh, instances of the last few years with PTSD as – uh, our veterans come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, who by and large are uh, are gun owners and gun advocates. Uh, some of them really do need some treatment with with their to, to address their issues, and it's a very serious topic. and And any legislation that that disincentivizes them from getting the appropriate mental health is only going to create more problems in uh, in the future. And so. Uh, very tricky issue. I don't have solutions for it, but mm -hmm. something that, that we have to talk out honestly and thoroughly and not just limit ourselves to uh, one particular issue over another. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for joining me today, Daskro. Oh, thank you. If you've got any more comments, guys, to add to this, uh, I'd be interested to read them, but please bear in mind this is a sensitive issue, and also please bear in mind it's a complex issue. As I've already explained, there are many many factors when it comes to these uh, debates and topics it's not as simple as one straightforward answer please keep that in mind when you make your comments onto this video thanks for watching guys and uh, see you next time if you've enjoyed it as always please rate and share and i'll see you next time